Hello there, welcome back to the Agostino Zinger Show with me, your host, Agostino Zinger, and this is episode number 293. That's 293. If it's your first time listening, then um, thanks for tuning in. If it's your second time listening, then thanks for coming back. And if you've never heard of me before, <laughs> got ya. Anyway, um, welcome back to the show. As I'm sure most of you are aware, we're going through a pretty trying time somewhere around the world or everywhere in most parts of the world. I think apart from maybe um, Russia for the most part, hasn't really felt the impact of the coronavirus, but everyone's kind of dealing with it in their own specific way. Um, I'm not going to start the show by talking about that because, you know, I think we're all a bit fatigued about the COVID-19 updates. So I'm probably going to go through some other stuff and bits and pieces I've done. But if it's your first time listening to a show, this is the number one culture and streetwear podcast in the world. Culture encompasses art, music, fashion, all that other good stuff. And of course, streetwear, my number one love. And I also get into literary delights. So as you can see behind me, I have loads of books that I also kind of review on here. So if you like that kind of stuff, then please keep tuning in. If you want to support the show, then please smash that like button, hit subscribe, leave me a comment in the comments below. If you listen via the audio podcast, share it with your friends, five star review, all that good stuff. It'll go a long way into helping spread the message and get it out there. As I'm sure most of you are probably not aware, I've now put my podcast up on Libsyn. I was a a big fan. I was a big um, Spreaker backer in the beginning. I think Spreaker was the kind of OG platform that I used because it was the easiest to get in. I kind of abide by the um, minimal viable minimal viable option or is it as i call it what is it or the minimum effective dose method right from um that's a that's kind of popularized by tim ferris where essentially or it's kind of in casey nice that also has that kind of methodology or the kind of way of working where it's not about the it's not about the gear you're using it's about what you do with the stuff that you have available so when i started my podcast back in i don't know 2010 or whatever it was i used to just record it on my little i had little audio record a thing that reporters use and i just kind of get use that audio wise upload that onto like i don't know at the time must have been audacity or something uh cut it trim it whatever it may be and then upload it onto spreaker and spreaker was the easiest thing to do to kind of use and i think it had its own editing software at the beginning as well i think so i think i just maybe just trimmed it on my phone or something or whatever it may be so i started using the tape recorder i started using my phone and that was basically the main reason for using it but libsyn is pretty cool because first of all you can host it on libsyn that directly like Spreaker it's kind of like a hosting platform like SoundCloud but you also get this nice little kind of blog page sort of like look where you can kind of have all your episodes listed and all the links in there and you can and you can kind of hyperlink text as well because with Spreaker you couldn't actually edit the HTML or the CSS of what you call it where you kind of like edit the text so you kind of had to just put the link next to the text itself so that makes it a little bit easier and in general it's the platform that everyone uses it's the one that I think people trust the numbers a bit better on their analytics wise so if in the future I do end up getting some sponsorship or some brand deals with the, with the podcast it can kind of be a good way to kind of show hey I'm getting downloads needed to kind of boost myself forward so definitely check me out on um, Libsyn I'll get up on the screen to just check out but this is my Libsyn page I haven't really done much with it I've just kind of uploaded and fed through all my podcasts on there but it's got all the links um, specific to the show will be found in the description so if you want to click on it you can obviously click the description there and um, so as per like the 291 show you can click that description scroll down you can see all the links on there but as you can see with the most recent show when I added a text when I added a little link for the 292 show, it had already, I could already kind of edit the hyperlink on there and kind of attach a little link on the side of it. So that makes it a little bit more easier. So definitely check me out on there. You can find it at the Agostino Zinger Show, all one word, .com. But again, I'll link it in the show notes for you guys to check out. It's an easy way for you to just to see the show, see what's going on and kind of keep abreast that way. And of course, the handy thing with it is that at the top of the show, at the page as well, You've got the added edition of all the sites where it's kind of listed. So you've got the Apple podcast sign here. You've got the Spotify sign. You've got my YouTube channel. All that good stuff is all listed on the same. Quickly just kind of get access to it. So I'll definitely be sharing that on all my socials. So check that out. Talking about socials, of course, follow me on Instagram. Um, all one word, actionalzinger.com. Or actionalzinger, all one word, not .com. Actionalzinger, all one word. Find me on Instagram. I'm posting a lot more now because, of course, I'm stuck indoors. You can tell I'm posting a lot more because I'm posting bloody outfit pictures, which I never, ever do. So definitely check me out if you want to see that in regard. And some interesting memes. All that good stuff is on there, too. You know, I'm sure you guys are aware and you've heard this. You've seen the Corona Dance move. Video. But I'm posting all that up on there as well. So definitely check that out. Um, but yeah, um, I'm on the socials. Check me out. Check me out. So before we get started and speaking about current events, I thought I'd just go over a book that I finally completed as of this morning, 
Well, I kind of finished most of it, but I just had a little few pages left at the back. Towards the end, and it's the Gucci Mane, the autobiography of Gucci Mane, which I just finished uh, this morning. Um, interesting book. I'd say an easy read. I kind of ran through it in basically two weeks, but then I know I kind of left the last bit because I thought I kind of summed up the entire story. But to kind of sum it up, this kind of charts Gucci Mane. I think just prior to him, it, in detail mostly, you get a big account of his kind of upbringing. You find out there there is an actual big Gucci, right? Someone in his family that he was kind of named after, which is hence the name Gucci Mane. Um, there was an interesting past in terms of how he dealt with coming up in the drug game. There was also an interesting idea that even though he, I don't know, I, Gucci Mane kind of struck me from the beginning as always kind of being like, there's a, um, there's a lot of those people in hip hop now where they're sort of like the trap star become rapper, right? You're sort of like the popular guy in the hood, popular guy in the ends. And you kind of segue that fame into getting behind a microphone, getting in front of a camera and kind of making more of yourself that way, right? And you kind of use the street fame to kind of prop up your music and, you know, it can kind of build a cult following around you. But it seems as if Gucci Mane was reluctant to kind of, number one, glorify that street fame he had. And he was also very much about the music. He was, a, from the very beginning, he went to have a prolific cat catalogue, right? He went to have a discography that was long. And I've always kind of been intrigued by his approach to making mixtapes or putting out albums he doesn't seem to really have any i wouldn't say care for quality control but there, t there tends to be a, uh he tends to have this approach where he would rather have more music out there to feed his fans than to put than to kind of hold off on releasing stuff in order for it to fit a project that he had not really re realized or hashed out yet so he'd rather just like whatever he records if it's ready and it's done and if he's been you know if he had a two-week period where he's just been locked in the studio and he's produced 24 songs he'd rather put those out as a collection of 24 songs for that period in time as opposed to like okay let me take four out there and put it over there and then take four over here and send it out and he'd rather just release them all out and there is an argument to be said that part of um the reason why maybe Gucci Mane is maybe severely underrated maybe in the same way like a chief keep is because they were unable to have that quality control like a lot of the best chief keep stuff i've probably seen online you know not to be unfair has been some of the fan edits that have been kind of they'll take mixtapes they'll take kind of material from freestyles and they'll kind of put it together into their own hodgepodge mixtape and sort of have it uploaded for like you know for people to enjoy and those have been some of the best things i've got from gucci or even from chief keith some of their own projects have been a little bit lackluster but i also appreciate the fact that he's just a machine he consistently just puts out project after project after project and i guess in some way shape or form even if he wasn't necessarily destined to be a hip-hop great or a legend or to be successful no no to be a legend whatever it may be he was going to be successful because of the amount of time and repetition that he put into his work like i don't it's i'm not sure maybe um american idol and x-factor guests are a weird sort of like um anomaly in this but I don't think it's possible to do something that often to that level that yeah on that sort of level consistency and not get good at it you have to get good or you have to be at least passable and then I think a lot of it has to do with staying power that's a lot you hear about the story from Gucci Mane and his autobiography is that he withstood so many trials and tribulations right so many things came at him in life but some, most of it of course was his own sort of like self-sabotage every time he seemed to like get a bit of a headway in his life he would do some sort of brain dead numb skull thing like fight a random in a supermarket in a shopping mall somewhere in mid america um just as he was getting his life in order he'd kind of succumb himself to drugs and alcohol loads of things happened during that process but he just ended up he just got this stickability about him he just doesn't he doesn't um go away like even when he's gone away when he comes back out he's, you know, he's got you know uh, straight, uh, what do you call it? First day out, fuck the feds. You know what I mean? He's got that kind of work ethic where consistently just uh, he's always showing up. And I guess, again, that's a lesson that could be applied to anyone in life, right? Um, the idea of just hanging around long enough and waiting for the opportunity to come or waiting for other people to leave and then for you just to be the only default choice is a good option. I don't think it's a bad option. I think the idea that you're going to be divinely chosen and picked up from a crowd of like oh we want you that one over there is special isn't necessarily how things go happen isn't it most things happen it's because of luck right it's because of being in the right place at the right time but to take advantage of that right place right time you have to be in the right mindset you have to be doing the work you have to be approaching it with a with a kind of studious work work, work ethic and all that sort of good stuff so that was very interesting and i also like the idea that for the very beginning he was all he always had the idea of being a barry gordy character right the kind of puppet master behind the artist or the artist's 
um, in his clique, the guy that was kind of pushing the scene forward um, without everyone knowing that it was him. So the kind of rapping thing came after. More so, he wanted to be the hood, the guy on the streets who kind of put in money behind the established artist to kind of diversify his portfolio, so to speak. And that's obviously carried on with the stuff that he's done nowadays, right? With the people that he's signed now. I think he signed recently some new kid um, to 1017, whatever his new imprint he's got. But he kind of specifies in the book that he never wanted, I think, which is something that, again, which I think you make decisions in your life and you decide to kind of just stick with it. It's quite hard to do. But he did say in the book that um, when he decided to put a record label, put a roster together, he very he didn't want to repeat the same mistakes that he did when he was on the streets. So I think on the streets he was known to be a bit shady. I think Waka Flocka kind of spoke upon it a little bit when they were going through their back and forth. He kind of did make some overtures that, you know, Gucci isn't the guy that everyone thinks he is. He's a you know, he's got a lot of enemies in the streets, which is why he kind of intimated that that's why Gucci was kind of holed up in his house somewhere in the middle of LA and not kind of going back to the hood. And why haven't you seen Gucci back in the hood? Because obviously what people have still got money on his head, blah 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 blah. And he kind of speaks about that a little bit, you know, in you know, without saying too much, saying basically that he didn't want to repeat the same mistakes. He didn't want to be that same guy in the hood that he was, that he's going to be in the music industry. He wanted to kind of put a platform there in the music industry to kind of prop up the young guy. And he said it was a, it was a cheat code for him to kind of always stay plugged in because he was always he was always aware that he was never going to be the most hippest on point guy. But he just wanted to have a, he wanted to have, he wanted to use, he wanted to have those artists on his label and use them as a temperature gauge just to kind of gauge what's going on. And I guess that's what he's been able to do really well because, I think that's the one thing um, Dame Dash mentioned quite often in his interviews, right? That whenever people are like, oh, why aren't you back in the hip-hop game? Why aren't you back in the club doing signing artists? And he'd always say something along the lines of like, he always was afraid of being the 40-year-old guy in a nightclub, you know, trying to get down with the kids. No one wants to do that, right? So the only way to do that, the only way to circumvent that is to kind of sign people around you who are younger, who can do the work for you, and then you can oversee it from like a mogul point of view and see the longer, uh, bigger play at work and make decisions based on that way. But to, to but to kind of you know for him to kind of be at one of hanging out with the children, or to be at you know H Hollywood whatever next establishment isn't necessarily the best way to kind of use his expertise. You kind of want Gucci to be a bit further down the line, right? You kind of want your sort of like um, scene kind of influencers to do all the legwork and then for them to kind of vet the person and then when they're ready bring them to you and that's good you can then kind of you know um, polish them up and adjust and do all the fine tuning to then present them to the world but if Gucci's the one at the nightclub it just doesn't work make, make sense I think that's again part of the reason why he's been such a legend and been so on that a lot of kids have kind of looked up to him for you know what you can model his career around it because I think similar to like who I would say Maybe not. It's not. I don't know. There's quite a few of them. I think maybe people wouldn't, just wouldn't subscribe. But I think even similar to something like Two Chains, I would. You wouldn't say Two Chains was like a nat naturally gifted rapper, but for just hard work and perseverance, they've turned into absolute animals. And I think that's what I kind of get from the story of Gucci Mane. Like maybe he wasn't. You know, he wasn't born to be Nasir, right? He wasn't born to be Rick Ross or Jay Z. But what he had was work ethic to outwork everyone else that was had the as as aspirations to be those dudes. So. Maybe he wasn't as talented, but the hard work, the hustle just kind of boosted him to that level. So I really recommend you check out the book. Again, it's a really short read. You could probably get through it. If there's an audio book available, which I think there is, but I don't think it's read by him. I don't think so, but definitely check it out. Geography, Autobiography by Gucci Mane by Neil Martinez uh, Belkin. It's a superb book, really great. Loads of amazing pictures as well that I'll show for the camera for you guys just to see what it's about. But yeah, loads of interesting pictures of Gucci from back in the day. With his belly, show you here. Yeah, with his huge belly from back in the day. Do you remember all those pictures? Yeah, it was a good era. And you think he mentions in the book as well the reason why his belly was so big is because of the lean. It supposedly makes your belly go potty and stuff. So he wasn't, so which is true because when you look at his chest, he didn't look that fat. It's just you know the bloatedness that came from alcohol for the most part. And he got sober in jail. He speaks really well about his wife Keisha on here too. And just as a, it's a, but again, I think it's a good book because they, every time you think he just about gets his life sorted and he's got everything worked out, he fucks up again. Like it just continually goes on until the very end when he finally gets it together and makes a change. But I think the fact that the record industry gave him so many chances just speaks to the character that he has, the character of the man, I think for the most part. I think most people could tell that he's a good dude because I think that's something I've learned quite 
um, I've learned as well, especially from listening to a lot of comedy, uh, comedy-based podcasts. They were talking about Hollywood and the industry. And one thing you always hear a lot is that you know, anytime you're sat there wondering where a certain actor is, right, a certain performer, a certain entertainer. If you're wondering where they are, you haven't seen them in a while, it's usually because, number one, they probably got lost in the source and they're not working, right? They're not going to audition and stuff. And secondly, it's down to the fact that, you know, they're not well-liked in the industry. People just think they're a pain in the ass to deal with. So the industry usually just shuts their doors on you because much like sports, um, there's always a conveyor belt of people waiting to take your place, right? Ready and willing to work hard, to hustle, to bust their ass and shit. So if you're the kind of diva on set and you're only 21, and you've got not many, you don't have many credits to your name apart from, I don't know, one really famous film you did when you were 17, you can't rest on your laurels. You have to assume that if you piss somebody off, they're just going to get you out of the way and get the next person in who's not a headache to deal with. So I think even though Gucci got involved, with, got arrested by the police and all this sort of stuff, I think deep down a lot of people in the industry kind of liked him and they thought he had a big part to play and obviously he's super plugged in with the Atlanta scene. They always wanted to give him a chance because the talent was obviously there and the work ethic was too. You just got lost in the source, as he famously says in his own interview. So, um, again, I think it's a great cautionary tale. It's a, again, it's not too fluffy, and it tells the story of somebody who I kind of consider to be a mainstay in the industry and somebody who's kind of flown the flag for collaborating with those different people, putting out experimental projects, um, really changing the game in terms of the amount of projects he put out. His discography must be, I don't know, it must be in the high hundreds, isn't it? Or no high, well, high double digits probably you know let's see how many actual tapes Gucci Mane actually has out I want to see this myself let's check this up on the screen put this up on here ba, 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 ba. let's see discography of Gucci Mane and he probably has prob- and I think I like the thing he says in the autobiography about something like um when he decides to make a change, he just decides to do it. Like he decided that this was going to be his life. He's just going to leave a sober existence and just get back to working hard. And he's just stuck with it. It hasn't been that difficult. And I guess you qu- I, I quite like hearing that message. You hear some too often people are like, oh, it was so difficult. I had to do this. I, had to do this. You know what I mean, like I like the idea that he was like, no, I made it this like I fucked up so, so many times in my life. The only other option was to just get right. And, you know, he got right. And look where he's at now. So let's see. He's, um, studio albums how many is that so far one two so trap house hard to kill trap back to the trap house murder was the case the state of Roderick davis the appeal the return of mr zone six everybody looking the return of east atlanta santa mr davis el gato the human glacier i love that title so much evil genius Delusions of Grandeur, Rutoba, East Atlanta, Santa. But you can definitely tell the difference in direction from that 2016 onwards, especially with the names of the albums. But that's already what? That's like 11 or 12 projects, isn't it? Right? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 projects. That is insane. 16. And that's not even including all the kind of the mix text you put out over the years. The mix text is just, look at this. The mix text is just insane. It just keeps going. And um, maybe there's a clever play there because you know with um, Megan Thee Stallion's label situation and her deal, maybe there was a clever play in terms of instead of listing your stuff as mixtapes, you put them out as studio albums so that you can kind of quicken the process of you getting out of your deal and then renegotiating it. Because if you, but then I guess most artists don't want to do that because they're afraid of one of their they're afraid that album number five out of six that's come out in four years performs really badly sales wise so that it's going to decrease their chance of negotiating properly but i don't know if i would renegotiate with a record label i'd renegotiate based on my entire catalog not what my what not what i did last right because even if you get a deal from a record label usually you're signing a deal with x amount of numbers x amount of albums in place anyway right yes i know a lot of the record labels are looking at what you, how you perform first week and that sort of stuff and it's it really is uh, probably a bit of a what did you do for me lately industry but i don't know if i did five albums and i completed it i'd want you to look at the entire catalog of the five like what i've done along with it marketing events promotion activations interviews all that stuff will kind of play into your renegotiating i'd imagine so right podcast appearances um traction on social media in terms of if you've been imagine you went to like a fashion show and you happen to have the picture that went the most viral that would also play into the fact that how you negotiate. So I don't know why a lot more artists don't do what he did. Now, I guess the only close example I'd say is maybe like a Russ, right? He did the prolonged period of like dropping a tune. Is it a tune a week? 
right for ages he just went one with a new song and that kind of built a lot of traction up and um that kind of gave people a chance to kind of again i guess if you're a fan of russ you'd probably be able to see a change from like track one one week one to week 15 to week 13 to week 27 right there was definitely a progression there you'd hope so and i'm assuming he probably got better understanding what his audience wants what his sound is about and then once you go to negotiate they wouldn't just take the last track you upload number 96 they look at the entire catalog and be like oh whoa we definitely saw you got like 22 players on number one and now all of a sudden number 85 is like 55 i don't know 500 000 some shit that'd be a good little way to kind of show that organically you're able to grow your audience so just imagine if you're able to plug into like a major label what that could do for your career so that would probably be a good way to look at it but i don't know maybe there's more intrinsic details i'm not aware of in the record label industry but i think that's a good way to kind of look and maneuver the situation but again like i said um, definitely check out the book it's available now on amazon all, that, all those other good places and probably available on audiobook too but yeah it's a really short read easy to get through and um yeah i enjoyed kind of finding out a bit more about someone that i kind of looked up to for a long time well i still look up to actually in terms of how he approaches the industry and that stuff so yeah check that out so let's move on to the next thing what do we have to talk about here i think we should get into some corona updates right um let's talk about it how it kind of affects the london clubbing scene i guess because that might be of area of interest for me personally and stuff that i talk about I think we've seen what it's done in terms of how it's ravaged um, entire neighborhoods, uh, countries, especially in Italy. I watched a video recently now that kind of spoke about the damage it's caused in Bergamo. And um, a lot of it, obviously, is kind of due to the fact that, you know, especially in those Mediterranean countries, a lot of the families live in one building, right? So on different levels. So you might have a, a, a huge, a bigger density of older folk living in one street. So maybe the numbers are inflated a little bit. But the fact that, you know, these families were, you know, healthy and living and coping with their ailments, whatever they may be. Because a lot of people are like, oh, if you've got pre-existing conditions, it kind of affects you badly. And people are like a bit dismissive about it. But people who have pre you know, if you hear of sportsmen saying that they always play injured, right? People always have some kind of ailment they're dealing with, whether they know it or they don't, right? Um, you just kind of get along with life because you don't want to, you know, rest on your, rest on, you don't want to kind of waste your time thinking about things you can't necessarily change or whatever it may be. So to think that those ailments that they were all right, that they were okay managing and coping with have suddenly now accelerated the disease that they had no idea existed a couple of weeks ago is frightening, especially because most of these people are um, mainstays of the family. They're the ones that hold it together, right? They might be disputing sections of the family. People don't get along, but, you know, the grandma, the granddad is the one that kind of holds things down and makes sure, you know, people are talking and communicating they get around the table they eat they share some wine they hang out so for those people to go missing it's probably a bigger blow than some people would actually want to kind of you know really rationalize especially if you're one of the people that are like oh there's too many humans on the planet well let's take away someone from you that you love and you kind of cherish and see how you feel about it. there's too many humans on the planet it's such a weird way to look at the world but you know what can you do um so this so let's go into some club news from a resident advisor who do a good job of kind of rounding up some of the events that's happening um the article from the advisor is getting up on here so it's the latest of what's kind of going on in the scene and how they're approaching it there's been a lot of um live streaming of dj sets and stuff which you know has been okay i've kind of done my one or two here and there but i've kind of just uploaded them as an audio thing onto soundcloud you can check that out i'll put it in the show notes for you to see if you want to listen to some of our mixes i put together but there's been a lot of kind of memeing on the on the facebook pages about you know these sets being attended by one or two people not really people caring and maybe it's the fact that this might not be the best time to i don't know for performers or djs to kind of be pushing out live mixes probably the the kind of uh the sentiment in the world isn't for tap dancing or pump in the air or you know jumping around that you don't care and stuff no one really wants that now maybe that's the reason why and maybe there is a little bit of a feeling of these artists being a little bit disingenuous i don't know from the customer side of it because i just i don't know i'm curious because i've seen a lot of the streams i've checked some of them out i think the defective one recently did quite some quite good numbers but you know they've probably got a little bit more of a general population audience i think a lot of people that listen to defective records aren't necessarily your quote-unquote hardcore dance music you know enthusiasts they are in some respects but they just represent you know the general kind of like you know bbc radio one sort of like house listener who kind of tune into a late night set at 10 p.m or something um so that's probably not a good example but 
I guess really hardcore Detroit music fans, especially the ones who are freelancing or it's just in general, just everyday average day folk, they might not be in the best mood to kind of hear, you know, surgeon complain about not having, not being able to, you know, fly around the middle of Central Europe, you know, they don't really, I don't know, maybe that is, I'm not too sure, but the sentiment doesn't seem to be that great in terms of the mixes and stuff. Um, I've seen a lot of the more macabre, sort of like dark, um, gloomy mixes doing quite well. People are like, oh, I'm, I'm, rep- I'm kind of reflecting the times and playing all this kind of ambient, you know, um, industrial, post-apocalyptic sort of shit. And that's connecting with people because people kind of maybe want to just like drown in their sorrows and kind of, you know, have a soundtrack to go along with it. But I don't know. So anyway, this is an article from a resident advisor. So the coronavirus latest, um, they kind of sum up some of the stuff that's happening. So let's go through some stuff here. Uh, March 23rd news. Um, Rainbow Disco Club are hosting a live stream event April 18th, another one. The day is now cancelled. Festival is supposed to take place from the first festival in Chubu. The lineup features Deja Nobu, Kenji Takayama, Yoshinori, Haishi, and more. So the live sets are interesting, right? So essentially, a lot of these things, I think um, Defected Records, I don't think that was a festival. That might have just been the thing they just did last minute. I'm not too sure. Don't quote me on that. Um, but essentially they're hosting them in like empty nightclubs and they're having the DJs come up and perform a set right I think they're defective records let me just actually try and see if I can get that one up the defective records was quite interesting because I think they had everyone playing like a one hour or a two hour set I think it was like a two hour set each person played and it kind of went from there um, that can work I don't get me wrong but I don't know in terms of an experience for punters unless you're I guess unless you're working from home, you just want to have it on in the background and let your phone play out, maybe. Because I think some of them were live streamed on, on Instagram and shit, and some of them did through YouTube. But it, okay, of course, it depends what you're doing. If you've got a job where it requires your full attention, you might not want to have, you know, 120 BPM plus tunes playing in the background. You might just want to keep it a bit quiet. I'm not too sure. But let's just um, see if I can get this up on here. There's a defected record. Let's see if I can get up here. Records. There's like a little live stream thing they've done, but my thing is getting a bit crazy. Yeah, so this is the one live at that pitted record. So this is the someone playing here. This clip thing doesn't matter who it is. This is Nelva Baptiste. Hope it loads up here. My computer's running a bit slow, so excuse this. To the few who are in but essentially we've got a couple side of the moment big shout to you Premier and wherever Premier you are Premier in the world Premier. right now thank you so much for joining us my name's melba like yeah, like for the next that, hour that, that obviously helps with the situation but i don't know it's something that obviously can get looked at future going down the line in terms of how you kind of interact with people but part of the reason why these things work in real in you know in a normal setting is because you get to especially like Tomorrowland, you get to see the cameraman go in the crowd and you get to spot, you know, if you're a creep, you get to spot a hot girl. If you're a dude, you get to spot that guy that's kind of gurning to the side. You get to see what people are wearing, the flags they've got, the signs. It's all quite cool to see, but just pointing a camera in the DJ as he's playing, it's a bit boring, isn't it, right? To be honest, isn't it? I play myself at a much lower level and I don't know, I couldn't think of anything less fun to do than staring at a DJ playing in an empty club. It's, it's sort of like, you know, would you want to, would you want to just stand there and watch an artist paint a mural all day long? Like, I know people do that when they go to Brick Lane. They see someone defeated on the side of the street and they look for about five minutes. But then you just keep it moving because it's boring, isn't it? You want to see the work when it's done. You want to see it maybe in a setting of it being a celebration of the unveiling of this piece. You don't want to stand there and see the guy stenciling out the thing and obsessing over a line, whether it should go that way or that way. That's not fun. And I guess the same thing in this. Like, part of the reason why these experiences are interesting or they have some sort of a... Uh, cultural relevance is because they bring loads of people together under one roof right you get to doesn't matter what you earn your sexual orientation your religious beliefs where you're from um you know you're all under this one roof you know dancing celebrating yourself having a good time um but then to stand to be at home isolated doing it is a bit weird so maybe that's where the disconnect comes from and maybe in some respects especially some of the platforms are just asking people to donate and this money gets sent to like a you know a community fund but some people are obviously doing it so they can supplement their income that they've lost from the gigs that they've done. And if you're an avid, you know, dance music fan, you would know that a lot of these artists get paid, you know, 
a lot to play these big festivals and these big clubs so it's quite hard to have sympathy with somebody that's you know gets blown around all over the place first class sometimes regards it maybe and then gets paid you know 20 grand to play one or two hours of a set where they didn't make any of the music it's quite difficult to do and again i'm not that person to say that i you know let people make as much you know i'm i want people to make as much as they want uh run it up you know uh, i think we will have a part, part to play in society but i can imagine some people being a bit like mm, i'm not gonna waste my internet you know broadband uh data speed download whatever it may be watching someone play in an empty club and somewhere in the old gate and then have them request donations you know it's a bit you know it's a bit much especially when you know you might not be in a job in the next couple of weeks but yeah perfectly oh. decent thing to do i guess for some people hey, i know some some people had dancers on stage that was a bit weird um but yeah, the live streaming thing, I'm just not too sure how that works. Which is probably why, as much as people kind of rag on... As much, like, you know, just seeing some... Uh, I guess you have to you have to try and be... A, the good thing about Defected is that they have a big roster of DJs who kind of do the whole tech house, deep house thing. So they have all the people that kind of put their hands in the air and spin around and shit. And they're all, you know, they're quite... Uh, they're, they're not, for lack of a better term... They're all performers. They kind of know how to entertain behind the decks. Um, uh, they're not kind of like you know the macabre or like serious you know um, you know Berlin kind of kind of scene people. They're a little bit more happy clappy, um, which is, kind of lends itself to this sort of platform. But part of the reason why Boiler Room works, even though people rag on it, is because you get to see the audience, right? Those Boiler Room sort of like compilation videos they make of people you know acting weird on the dance floor, doing dumb things, or bumping into the mixer. They're fun because that's just an everyday night. That's an everyday weekend to some people, so just to see someone doing their decks is a little bit, a mm, little bit weird. So, um, but then I understand again for the festival for the people that are hosting the thing, especially if you've got, I guess if you've got your own club, and you've already paid the rent, I don't know, a year in advance or something, and you've already got the event booked up, you've paid a deposit for people to come over, or you paid them in advance, it might be beneficial just to kind of throw the, the you know, put a webcam in front of the decks and just kind of get them to play. Why not? Um, but again, you know social distancing you know eliminating kind of social gatherings is kind of gone out the window because i'm sure you know with these big djs there's probably 10 handlers around them a group of kind of you know hangers on and groupies it's not as if they're just turning up there on their own in it so yeah that's one approach to it so let's continue um you can check that out yourself if you want to see it it's on you know the defective youtube channel um next news on there you've got the welsh festival free rotation has been postponed until 2021 we're seeing a lot of that happening i'm assuming some of the ones that are gonna some of the festivals that are happening in like june july august they're already trying to bump pump the brakes and saying look we're off come back next year which kind of makes you think what, what what's the english premier league doing there was a statement that came out from the english premier league saying oh we want to get everything started or when I think the was it the 14th of April or something, which is really optimistic, or even the end of April, super optimistic. They said they want to get people back into training, which doesn't make any sense, really, in it. But I guess in terms of the rules, they're aware that by the end of I think the the rules say the Premier League has to kind of end or wrap up. Is it the end of June, right? Things should be end of June because that's when the transfer window opens at the first of July, I think. So they have to effectively have the season finished by the end of June. So they're trying to rush everything before them, um, which I think, you know, if everything works out well, I'm sure the players wouldn't mind playing, you know, nine games back to back because they're probably all itching to kick a ball again. But in terms of actual, you know, safety, especially for the people that are going and especially not even for the players, more so for the people that are just supporting them, you know, physios and club staff, training ground people, caterers and all that sort of stuff. It's probably not the wise thing to do. And I just don't think it's possible because, you know, if Coachella is cancelling their event, which you know has a million corporate sponsors maybe it's maybe not on par with the football don't get me wrong but it's a it it, it, it does include a lot of stakeholders if they're cancelling their thing i don't think the premier league has any way of kind of making sure people get back to training by april or start playing again by may it's not going to happen at all um then you've got next year you've got leon festival noir sonoir what's that how do you call that Noir sonorous i have you pronounced that has been postponed until 20 has been postponed until what july right no has, has postponed its 2020 edition from may through the may 19th to the 24th until july so they're going to push it back to july and see what happened which is you know kind of sensible i think a lot of these festivals have a lot of money tied up in insurance and you know they don't want to get penalized by the company because i'm sure some of the insurance companies are not going to 
be very forgiving about these natural events kind of canceling canceling the parties they're just going to be like look pay us we don't give a shit so they probably want to make sure that they kind of keep postponing it in the hope that it does go through um because i guess because some of the i've, I've kind of thinking that like, even if you do if you're even if you're able to kind of secure a license or to kind of you're kind of able to postpone your event until july it doesn't necessarily guarantee anyone's going to turn up right there's going to be a big there's going to be obviously a, a huge segment of the population that's going to be like you know what time to celebrate time to get happy time to get drunk but there's also going to be a population of people who are going to be like you know what i don't trust this announcement everything is fine just yet i'm going to wait off because some of the reactions especially to some of the countries or the uk has been suffered from it a lot there's been a little bit of hesitancy to kind of really attack it and prevent the spread as it's cap as it's happening in other places so if you're a cautious person why would you then believe suddenly the government when they say everything is fine and just go out straight away you probably would hold off a little bit right you'd be like you know what? i'm not gonna rush in there just yet it's sort of like the an analogy is like you know if you go to a house party or you go to like a shindig in a kind of white collar of you know a white collar event you're not going to be, the, you don't want to be the first person running to the buffet table, right? You don't want to be the first person trying to grab the hors d'oeuvres off this young girl's hand as she's walking around the, the, the room. You kind of want to observe the room, see who's around, make sure you don't make a prat of yourself and let somebody else kind of look like the animal. And then you kind of swoop in, you know, 20 minutes, 30 minutes later. I think it's the same sort of thing. So some of these events, I guess in their defense, I'll be like, you know what? It's better we take in some money than no money, right? Because, you know, they obviously do some of them make a lot of money through their brand sponsorship but a lot of the revenue comes from people who actually come in buy merch uh buy food buy drinks but you need people coming in there so even if it's half of the people who they confirm to come it's better than nothing i would assume so because i'm assuming when you cancel it you're probably spending money to kind of get out litigation or that sort of shit so um next we've got la-based live talent agency paradigm lays off 100 people out of about 700 staff bloody hell that is a madness what is paradigm is that like a I'm not too sure what a paradigm is actually that is crazy but that, that again is something you're going to see happening quite often i guess for the clubs as well it's going to be sad because the more expendable staff are the ones that actually hold them together like i'm assuming you know the bar staff the security or maybe not security because they're quite important they're going to always have a job there but you know maybe maintenance people all that sort of stuff they're obviously going to go and they're just going to recycle new people in and sometimes i think we've seen it especially in some of the kind of bigger clubs in london most of the times the reason why the vibe is off in places is because they sometimes cycle through employees too quickly or they dump them or they don't look after them and they don't realize that's how part of the reason why their place is successful you know if you look at next or why i don't know maybe it's not a good example but imagine they had a really interesting group of people working behind the bar cool people who happen to be you know the new hip kids on the scene that id magazine was featuring and shit and you suddenly then kick them all out because you want to move on or they because they're demanding too much of you and they want more money and you get other kids in suddenly your place isn't as cool as them because you didn't know that even though you've got sick lineups right and you do all the best promotion and you spend a lot of money on facebook ads the actual people that are actually moving and needle an actual kind of influence and culture are these kids who you know who kind of have five thousand followers on instagram yeah those are the ones that are actually doing stuff for you so with this whole virus stuff those are the first people that are going to get left behind or going to get kicked out or going to get you know uh, jobs get taken away from them and they club owners will think that are oh, they're replaceable i can just get someone else to serve a drink but it's not really about the serving of the drink it's about who's behind the bar who's what the vibe is about why all that sort of stuff is important it's kind of the intangibles uh but again um it to, to say there's not going to be any victims or any kind of uh collateral damage is you know impossible so that's probably part of it but yeah big up those people man 100 people who had a job like you know a couple of months ago and now kind of scrambling around looking for something and the bad thing about those kind of gigs as well is that some of the times especially those kind of i guess it depends if you want to if you want to stake a claim in the music industry i guess it's cool but if you just happen to stumble into the job it probably doesn't serve your cv well to go from there to somewhere else no one really you know i mean it's it's those weird jobs that don't really resonate well on paper so you get let go from a talent agency somewhere and you try and get you know a, a gig somewhere at coca-cola and they don't necessarily recognize it because they don't see they don't necessarily have an idea of what you did right i did an activation i handed out some tote bags it doesn't really resonate well because they just view it as some little fluffy duffy thing that anyone can do from their bedroom which might be true 
you know, a- again, like you kind of want to stay in that place for a while or at least allow yourself to build a reputation so that if you're, imagine the co-founder of Paradigm moves and sets up his own or division in a Coca-Cola, he can then poach that talent into Coca-Cola Builder and then you can get that corporate experience, that kind of real, you know, black and white experience to kind of take it another way. So sometimes getting those kind of jobs kind of can be a bit of a poison chalice because you, you're you only limited to working in that little niche industry. Of course, if you want to do that, it's fine, but I've usually found those kind of places are great for the clout, but then also not good for the career aspirations because they kind of limit your scope in it. And then finally here, we've got Tokyo Club Vent closes until April the 10th as well. So loads of um, casualties here. We have, um, what's and then for the March 22nd, we have another one here, just quickly, similar to the UK's decision uh, on Friday, Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison has announced a shutdown of nightclubs, bars and pubs, restaurants and many other non-essential services across the country. Um, any non-social domestic travel is being strongly discouraged with Queensland, South Australia, Western Australia and Tasmania effectively closing their borders to travellers from other states. So yeah, everyone's kind of feeling it and I've seen a lot of people say, oh, it's going to be amazing when everything reopens again. It's going to be the part of the central, this sort of stuff. I think, yeah, in one sense, but in the other sense, it's probably going to be really weird. It's going to be a lot of like doom and gloom. People have kind of, you know, essentially been, had their whole lives ripped apart from underneath their feet, are going to still be feeling the pain and to go out and celebrate and get drunk. Probably not the first thing that's going to be on their mind. And as well, who's to say governments might not just enforce this non essential policy? uh for like you know months years to come maybe they might say or you know they might kind of limit the amount that they have in the, in the city like just because you know they can say look we can probably get away with having five weather spoons and a couple independent bars and still make the same amount and not have the hassle of having police called quote unquote these independent or these kind of underground places um there's a lot of unanswered questions but again people's safety is obviously the main thing you don't want people dying you don't want people getting ill you don't want families being devastated the you know the enjoyment of people going out night out is the most important thing but just from just this conversation i can definitely see a lot of things not really returning to how they are ever again possibly and it probably could be for the best you never know it could be like you know people might be a bit more appreciative and respectful of the places they have and you know um back the events that they like and support the places that they support places they like and not give any game to the people they don't like all that sort of good stuff could happen but i don't know man I'm a bit dubious on that fact because I just think people can, you know, sometimes get caught in a groove, caught in the thing that they do all the time and just continue doing it. So that's probably not the best way, but who knows? Let's go into more jubilant news here. Um, I kind of looked at this interview with Elon Musk discussing some, or not interview, but a feature on Elon Musk that was featured on the National Review. Um, written by an author who has a book i think uh, mission is it mission to mars i've kind of ha- i've got it on my amazon wish list i'm definitely going to uh cop that in the next couple of weeks and have a read but it's an interesting um article because of course you know what we're going for at the moment um there's this idea that maybe this is a sign that we've exhausted the resources on planet earth that we should maybe look in to broaden our horizons and colonize other planet colonize other planets in order to kind of extend our lifespan um for generations to come of course some of the work that elon is doing it probably won't he will probably won't see the fruits of it until he's long gone i'm sure he's aware of that but the idea that you know we could be a multi-planetary species is now not so crazy as it was maybe when it first got announced i was a big fan of it anyway from the beginning because i just think it kind of feeds into my sci-fi fantasy um i've always kind of had aspirations of you know exploring other planets and going floating through the solar system but logic logic logistically and maybe practically probably is not something i'll end up doing but just the idea that somebody is out there pushing it and doing that is really interesting i remember seeing i remember hearing peter till talk once one of the co-founders of uh paypal and uh you know a person that was very instrumental in terms of kind of changing narrative around trump when he was trying to get elected he mentioned that he's, he was frustrated with the lack of progress in Silicon Valley, right? He was saying that there was a lot of, I think this was during a time when Angry Birds got bought out or something, right? Do you remember Angry Birds got sold to some company for a mad, mad amount, amount of money? I don't know if it was, but I remember him saying that there were too many startups that were focused on trying to make the next Angry Birds as opposed to really, uh, you know, 
changing human history forever right really kind of pushing things forward um not a lot of more people were doing it because most of the money was in making you know the tinder of the uber of right no one was really focused on kind of bigger problems that were kind of maybe you wouldn't necessarily see the fruits of it in your lifetime but they would they would kind of impact people from generations to come and um that got me thinking of course that was very true the statement and then you somehow have someone like you know must comes along you know he uh he wants to bore tunnels under la to kind of you know ease the traffic flow uh he wants to make electric cars the next big thing which is obviously it turned out to be um then he wants to make us a multi-planetary species but one of the things that kind of sparked my interest a lot with it that got me thinking was this idea that in order to kind of fund the project he wanted to make the starship that he's kind of going to fly everyone to mars to to kind of be able or especially at the time the bfr it had this point-to-point -point travel thing this idea that you could kind of get onto a starship or get into a Elon Musk rocket and it could take you to Singapore in 40 minutes right and then fly back again and that was a way to kind of generate income of course and then there was the idea that because the capacity the kind of the payload capacity was increased they could obviously get people to kind of pay for tickets to go to the Mars or to go to the moon all these really clever ideas around it but the idea of somehow being able to make uh, Mars habitable for people was something that a lot of people kind of scoffed at. But now that we're going through what we're going through, it, it doesn't seem that crazy. But I guess one of the things that you would kind of want from it, and I guess you can read, definitely check out this article. It's called um, Elon Musk's plan to settle on Mars. I won't really read the whole thing, but definitely check it out. It's got me thinking about all of that. I'll just have it in the show notes for you to go check out. But one of the things I was thinking about it was that if you do end up colonizing Mars, you can't do the same old, same old. You can't have us um, act in the way that we're acting now on Earth. You can't have the same systems in place. Because I look at some of the stuff that's happened, especially in America, in terms of how different states are dealing with the pandemic or the epidemic that we have going on at the moment with the coronavirus, is that they're all taking different leads on it. There's obviously a governmental oversight, but for the most part, the actionable stuff that's happening is happening on a state level via the mayor, right, via the governor. They're sort of actioning things, right? And people are doing it in different ways. Handling People have, you know, different levels of uh uh caution maybe different levels of risk avoidance wherever it may be so some of the results are being skewed and there's not a uniform approach which obviously isn't going to help everyone in the long term but it got me thinking about the idea that some of the people who are doing correctly right who are kind of taking it seriously maybe like you know andrew cromo uh cromo sorry the dude from uh the governor from new york who's kind of taking a big uh kind of you know who's kind of taking it taking the balls by the horn and really trying to prove his worth in that regard has take, done, done a good job but there's also a part of me that's a bit like you know what part of the reason why so many people are being so strong and kind of pushing things forward is because you know politics is a popularity contest they want to get elected next election so they're trying to make sure everyone knows that they're at front they're at the front of this you know they've got the tie off they've got the they've got the p buter judge uh sleeves rolled up they're trying to look like they're doing something just so they can get elected so it's not necessarily coming from like a sincere place so if you do go and colonize mars you don't want anyone doing anything for the sake of making people's lives you don't want anyone doing something in mars just for the sake of making sure they get elected you want systems in place that allows it to be it to work for the greater good and not just for individuals not just for like a certain subsect of people right i hear people on social media getting annoyed that you know celebrities are getting tests before regular folk it could be just you know the fact that they've got money you know money buys you access and and influence and connections and it is what it is but there's also this idea that why can't this approach be uniform why can't everyone with a means or that can prove they don't have the means be able to get those same resources right? that's what you'd want so if you do extend life onto mars you want to have an approach a system in place that benefits everybody everyone gets the benefit of it not just a certain subsect of people um you want to do things completely different to how you've done it on earth you don't want to have the same approaches you don't want to have the same uh i don't know populism ideas nationalistic ideas um selfishness you want people to operate in groups right or in tribes and not in silos and not on their own you want it to bend you want everything to go back to how you can benefit mars and not benefit a subsect of people of course there's going to be people that are going to you know diverge and do their own thing and become you know mars anarchists or whatever it may be but for the most part you want everyone to kind of pull in the same direction and that is the best way to do it and i guess looking at it now because i'm sure there's going to be a lot of people having conversations about oh things are going to change now for the better because you know situations happen and we've all realized how we need to be interconnected and how we are so similar but 
you also need to be aware that things might just continue going on as they have always have people are just going to go back to revert into type be selfish be self-absorbed and all that sort of stuff so the only way to kind of take a lesson from it is to note down what's happened note down the errors of our ways and then put a system in place that when we do go and explore you know the universe we kind of do things a bit differently because the last thing you'd want is to have this amazing terraform planet you know equipped with all the latest technology solar powered you know then be suddenly go back to what we know now where you've got this weird popularity contest between these dudes that all look the same all interconnected all have the same objectives have very sketchy business dealings right you hear all these stories about these politicians who had stock in certain x company and they offloaded it before the virus spread and accusations of insider trading and all this sort of really nefarious stuff that doesn't need to happen right because at the end of the day like we all have family members we all have people that we know who are elderly people who are in bad situations not through no fault of their own who are now being you know ripped apart who are now being taken away from their families because somebody somewhere on the cayman islands who you know is fucking over his own district has now sudden affected everyone else in, in the country or in the state in general so there definitely needs to be a different approach to it. and i guess reading this article especially um, from uh robert zubrin definitely made me um think that there needs to be a different approach to it because part of the reason why this guy really likes elon musk who i think he says he kind of feels like he got a lot of his ideas from him um is that i think it says in the end right uh yeah i've read this, this mb he says here um at this last two paragraphs says if you want to explore if you if you want to either explore or settle on mars you need to land on mars the goal of the dst plan which is from nasa however is neither exploration or settlement it's expenditure rather than offer the simplest most efficient path to the red planet the dst architecture offers the most complex in order to provide uh, rationales mb not reasons for as many new technology development programs as possible right so he's basically saying the nasa plan is just a whole waste of time then he kind of goes on to elon musk theory um, Elon Musk approaches the opposite. NASA's program is vendor-driven. He's purpose-driven. He's not concerned with justifying expenditures on a uh, raft of potentially useful technologies. He wants to get his program done with the least amount of new development. His attitude is, show me why I need it. He may push this too far. As noted, I believe he could be, uh, he'd be wise to develop a mini starship to reduce the power requirements for making a return fuel to Mars because I think his idea is to kind of have a starship launch into orbit, have another... Um, uh, ship come up with fuel refuel that starship and then that payload heads over to mars and then from mars when it lands by the time it lands whatever rover that was there before has terraformed the planet has been able to kind of extract some minerals to make the fuel that fuel then goes into that 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 kind of stuff and then by that time the other ones are coming up so they're reloading and then those are going back and forth but he needs to i say think he needs to produce a 50 i think now or maybe up to a thousand in order to kind of get it where it needs to be which again you know is nutty but the whole idea about it is this purpose of like extending life and the only way to do this is do it quickly you know the longer you take the less likely it's going to happen and he says um he kisses here uh da, da, da. Um, he may push this too far as noted i believe he'd be wise to develop a mini starship to reduce the power requirements uh for making the fuel to mars he disagrees he says show me Elon Musk says our conclusions on that point diverge but i really love the way he thinks and that's the most important part right because it's the kind of thinking that can get us there and i guess that's what we want we want people that are just thinking a bit different not just doing the same old same old that could be the best way to go about things because part of the hesitation some of these governors or some of these politicians are having in terms of dealing with the coronavirus isn't because they're not too sure if it's real they just don't want to make a mistake they don't want to be the person that acted too hot quickly hastily or was a bit too lax and then got blamed for it later on they all they just want to appear like they're doing something about doing something and again it's a very i think you once that's why i probably don't like listening to your politicians speak but then when you realize what how they sound and what they say you realize it's all a lot of fluff it's all a lot of bullshit they have a very particular skill of being able to say a lot of words right fit a lot of words into a sentence without actually addressing the point um you, you only look at someone like a mike pence who never really answers the questions directly he's always really good at kind of answering the question in a summer in a kind of roundabout way and then by the time he goes to the end where you think he's going to actually address your question he moves on to the next one it's a very clever trick but for the people that you know who are being governed by him who live in his constituency it's not the most entertaining thing to be a part of so um hoping this is something that we can explore later on again it's not something that's going to be appealing to everybody i think they're obviously touting tickets about hundred thousand to three hundred thousand each um which obviously is not going to be available to everyone but again there's an option to go so let's see what happens in it um 
if things don't change for the better and on earth i could definitely see people moving to another planet and trying to you know um live a more fulfilled life that way because you know if you have the means to why wouldn't you do it really uh, instead of sitting here complaining especially people that you know complaining they're going to move to canada that didn't do it but yeah definitely check out the article it's really interesting um it's titled here elon Musk plan to settle on mars by mr robert zubin is it no robert zubrin it's robert zubrin check that out I'll, again i'll link in the show notes it's on the national review website and then lastly here before we end we have this uh interesting story about clout chasing that i thought was quite interesting let's see if i can get it up on here where is it du, 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 du. One sec. But yeah. So, clout chasing. Clout chasing is um, it's a lot like clout chasing gets a bad rap in it. Similar to, um, similar to kids that buy their entire sneaker collection off of StockX, it gets a bit of a bad reputation. Um, I guess because of the term, it kind of you know. I guess it's similar to like fuck boy. You know, you don't want to be known as that because you know it has bad connotations or hype beasts and stuff. But I guess if you embrace it and you're able to kind of and it truthfully or accurately represents you, it's not such a bad thing. I don't think in that regards. Um, same with being an Instagram influencer or being a quote unquote thought. I don't think it's a bad thing if that actually actually what you are. You have to be able to live your truth, right? We only get one shot at this life. Why why waste your time trying to be uh, trying to ascribe yourself? Uh, a character or a trait or a personality that is not necessarily you just live your authentic self and kind of go from there so with that being said gq featured uh this kid called zach Bio on their site uh made an entire story kind of unraveling the mystery behind him what kind of makes him tick and i guess again i'm not that familiar with the dude i guess i've seen his face here and there on some people's pages but there's a lot of hoopla behind how he essentially got himself in a position where he's surrounded by you know the jenners the drakes the tyler the creators all these kind of people in culture people kind of lap up and i guess part of it has to do with this kind of the article does i think he has called this on gq said who is zach Beer, right i've got his here on the screen Let me put it up on there so i guess a lot of the fascination does come from this idea that i think most of the fascination comes from the the this thing that we haven't necessarily been able to categorize or to kind of uh make a term for it or to kind of figure out why what exactly this new celebrity is it's not the conventional because the conventional type was where well, you had a you had a talent right the talent that you had a service that you a talent or a product that you made right that necessarily put you on a pedestal and had people kind of you know that that's how you got your attention right you played the sax really well you were a beast on the piano you were kind of you know an animal on the guitar whatever it may be that's what kind of drew people towards you and then that's where you kind of got the whole idea behind celebrity right people went to follow you around blah, blah blah but obviously in the modern age especially with the advent of smartphone the social media things have kind of changed a little bit where the idea of talent is a bit uh, nefarious and a little bit it's a little bit irrelevant nowadays because part of the appeal of these kind of new celebrities is that they're like me and you right they're just average everyday folk who decide to kind of turn on their phone turn on their webcam get freaky and suddenly they receive a cult following because people connect with them or identify themselves with them in some way shape or form so it's hard to kind of get your head around it and because it's hard to get your head around it there's a big group of people on the internet who are like very much against it and very big of people who are very much for it I guess people for it are are kind of happy to see somebody that looks like them or looks like an average everyday folk kind of making it because it gives them hope and for people that aren't necessarily happy with it have this idea that everyone that's talent everyone that's a celebrity should be like michael jackson right they should be able they should be they should be so out of their kind of remit of what is possible that it makes sense why they're celebrity the fact that somebody just looks like you and is an average everyday folk kind of might make you feel a little bit envious it might make you feel a little bit bitter because you know it, why are they doing it and i'm not so it can get a bit weird to judge properly but i like it i think especially for the kids coming up it's great that they're able to see different ways of approaching a problem right and the problem might be you want more clout you want to get in the room you want to you know have a career in the arts and entertainment i like that they're able to see different paths towards it because i think yesteryears you know we did have a bit more of a clear way of defining what talent was but it was also really hard to get in right you had gatekeepers you had to convince somebody who wasn't necessarily doing anything who was just kind of you know holding the door open right signing forms faxing stuff um sending stuff in a post you had to convince them to let you in right 
and so usually those people were very aware that the job that they were doing anyone could do it so they wouldn't they would really make your life difficult they'd make it difficult for you to get in because they're afraid that if you do get in with your new energy and your new ideas you could take their job of course it's a scarcity mindset and it probably wasn't true if they kind of let you in and kind of mentored you they could probably have you could probably have helped them make you could they could you could have probably helped them look better but of course you know people don't think that way so i guess for the kids coming up it's good that they have the idea they have the idea that you don't need to be the Zach Beer dude. You could do it your own way. But he's shown you a different way to get involved where it doesn't require you to have an industry connection. You don't need to have, you don't need to be sucking up for certain artist or, you know, begging to get a look. It's an approach that kind of focuses on the work. And this is the way it kind of gets fishy because if you read the article, I think part of the, a bit of the first bit is a little bit more of, you know, there's a lot of like wanking off of the guy and, you know, make kind of setting the scene. It's a little bit fluffy. Obviously, you got this kind of cool picture of him DJing, and he's you know, alongside uh, Kai, Ger- Kai Gerber, right? The model. Um, it's a little bit fluffy, but once you get to the meat of it, what you realize is that, much like some of the socialites from back in the day, or some of the industry professionals that kind of worked their way up, a lot of this has just been a lot of hard work, and that's where it gets hard, right? Because the hard work that he's talking about is about going out, it's about socializing, it's about you know tagging people, sending DMs. Uh, befriending security guards bartenders event promoters bar managers all this stuff that doesn't really look well doesn't really resonate that well on social right no one gives a shit you taking a picture of you know big george at the front of one oak right people want to see the picture of you with drake but to in order to get the drake picture you need to befriend big george you need to get him a sandwich you need to buy him some weed right whatever you need to talk to him about the football all that is work and that requires you having to you know appear go to the club week day after day after day especially the la club scene where it's majority of the time i think they usually go out between the days of like wednesday and sunday right they, they don't really open that late either it's quite you know it's a bit like london everything closes at 2 a.m so there is a short window in order to kind of get the action and to kind of, and plus everything is spread out quite you know it's spread out um there's not a really good public transport system you have to drive everywhere you have to pay for parking so there's a lot of obstacles that kind of don't allow you to kind of bounce around and kind of connect and network with people you have to really be tactical in how you do it and you have to also hope that people like you but the entire story kind of really resonates because i like the idea that he kind of because you know you i think you read the story especially from reading on the forums you get this idea that he was this kid that you know his dad owned one oak i don't know one of these kind of bougie places but he's just a regular dude who kind of got an in because he was able to attend i think he went to a party once right and he bumped into fetty wap and fetty wap then kind of liked his vibe and from there the, from the bar manager got him back in again because he thought he's the one that was fetty wap's plug and then the kind of novelty that he looks the way he does also helps right he's kind of this rosy cheeked um infant looking dude who's actually 23 so he looks a lot younger than what he is and he doesn't look like anyone else that's on the scene it kind of helps his image right he's kind of like a a, a kind of a for lack of a better term like a chad sort of dude who kind of hangs around these cool places but also it doesn't look corny and it all looks organic but then one bit that i think was really handy what he said was again is something that kind of it doesn't need to be said but sometimes it's good to be said is that the way he got in and the way people liked him was that he was just normal right he was able to kind of vibe in the room he didn't first for the picture he didn't go for the selfie straight away he built an actual relationship and of course these relationships aren't necessarily real i think you realize i think i realized that i don't know should i say real because i'm putting i'm projecting a little bit but i realized that quite early on when i was doing my moving and shaking in london that i didn't necessarily have the des- the deposition de- 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 deposition or the temperament to do what he does i couldn't necessarily go to the club and you know try and finagle an entry in or beg to get on the list the times i did do it ended in catastrophe right it would end in a fucking shouting match of the suit because my pride got in the way i had too much of an ego I always assumed that I would be the one on the other side of the, of the other side of the rope, right? So it didn't allow me to go in there. And again, it might be a character flaw of mine on some regard, but I think you realize quite quickly where you sit in, or where you kind of want to be placed, right? So in positioning, you know, when some brands are like, oh, I want to be on the main floor, menswear floor on selfages, right? You want to be next to the brands that you kind of aspire to be like, even though your product might not be there. That's the kind of way that I think about things. So I kind of knew, okay, I can't be that dude. So I kind of took myself out of it but from afar i can definitely appreciate a kid like that who's able to kind of see where he fits in the grand scheme of things and then play his position he's not trying to be like the the guy in the front front 
you just want to be the guy you know left of center the one you always see behind like kind of maneuvering and networking and doing the thing and it's a very particular skill because i think sometimes what people don't realize is that once you get around actual celebrities right their aura and their kind of uh force field or their kind of a law it can kind of pull you in and start to make you think you're on their level you're the same people and you maybe get a bit too comfortable you get a bit too familiar and then that can suddenly uh put them off completely because they 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 have their spidey senses tingling because they know that because of their level of notoriety and celebrity people are always trying to extract value for them they're always trying to take 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 so the moment you kind of get around them and you start being thirsty the relationship just goes takes a nose dive but if you're able to kind of mellow down a little bit and understand the position that you play you, you let's just say i'm the list guy i get them on the list i get them in right you're able to do that in the right particular way it definitely can kind of boost your chances of actually becoming quote-unquote industry friends now again you're not friends friends they're not going to text your mom happy birthday they don't know your middle name um you know whatever it may be but and again as soon as you're not cool they're going to dump you but if you're able to kind of go into it clear-headed and know where you where you where you kind of sit know what the long-term plan is because again you can't do this forever right he's obviously got some things in the work i think he mentions he's going to go on tour with lucas about he's got an art gallery thing he wants to do he's got his own brand the psych world stuff that he does which i didn't know i learned on the thing i've seen the brand put on my instagram but he's behind that as well so those things are and obviously a way for him to kind of diversify his portfolio and diversify his kind of revenue stream and obviously his career prospects because he can go in different directions it might be an acting thing there he might be into stand-up you don't know whatever those are things to get into but as long as you know where you place and you know the hierarchy right you know where you sit I think it kind of works out better but I'm, I'm pretty sure people don't do it that often and people get a bit giddy because I'm sure once you get in a room with these people it just something happens to you where you just lose all your senses and you suddenly start to become a bit of a groupie but definitely reading the story you can definitely tell that a lot of the work that he'd done in the beginning is just kind of being the quote-unquote plug and kind of playing his position and just being chill really helped him establish actual connections with these people and again it must be nice if you're a celebrity and you're kind of hanging out with a kid who's just normal right he doesn't suck you off he talks about normal stuff he has interesting background interesting he has it's interesting i think that's what is that freud said that right to be interesting you have to be into into interesting things or something like that um that might be nice right not to have somebody that's just completely sucking oh i listened to your album it's so amazing like maybe he's able to pick out a track that he likes or ask about a particular arrangement or a track listing thing like that can be interesting but again i think it's a really good profile whether or not the kids will actually take knowledge of it and see what actually goes into achieving a picture like this is something to be said i don't know but i think it's good to see that there's different approaches to to getting in there and again i'm i'm all for it man i, I, I grew up in a generation where you had to kind of you know beg people to get on a guest list via email it's probably the sort of same thing but there was a little bit more of a there was a little bit more of a gatekeeper mentality right where they kind of wanted to keep all the fruits to themselves they didn't want to share it but i think with these kids now especially with the internet they're able to kind of make their own little thing and then kind of kind of insert that into the general population right into the kind of conversation and kind of expand from there um again really interesting profile and i think the last bit here kind of sums up why i think his approach works really well here's a thinker's approach i think a quote from like virgil that was really cool here what does it say here um yep so the the so here's a last bit i thought was really interesting here this paragraph here it says um we know we shouldn't care who zach beer is and yet we do but I'm starting to think it's an impulse worth following that we should care about the identity of this noted uh, celebrity pal. The music, the television industries are being turned inside out by streaming. The way we shop and go out and make friends has been transformed by the internet and social media. Fashion is being led by people like Virgil Abloh who weren't allowed to set shows a decade ago. And now Bia has put himself right there in the middle, straddling the line of talent, management, of influencer and fixer. If someone figured out how to turn uh, hanging out with cool people into a lifestyle, the business, wouldn't you want to talk to them? And I think that's interesting. I think that's, that is definitely because you could definitely not, I don't think anyone could do it. Because again, I think he mentions in the article that he goes out, you know, he's only been home two days in his life or something like that. So it is an excruciating, you know, schedule. It does require you to, because you're. I don't know if he drinks a lot, you have to kind of make sure your regiment is quite, direct you have to know where to be you can't waste time in shitty places you've got to be able to i think you mentioned the article you've got to move like a shark on the dance floor and bounce around from spot to spot and talk to the right people but again it shows where the levels are at so if you're able to kind of take his approach and apply it to your level pace of interest 
um, you could go far because just to sit there and rely on your talent alone, because I think that's what I spoke about in the beginning, talent is important, but how you're able to market yourself and position yourself is also very much imp- is also as important or maybe more important because, you know, you can have all the talent in the world, but if you don't have the right broadcasting methods or the right way to kind of amplify your message, who's going to know about it? And if no one knows about it, why are you making it? That's the problem that we have on there. But yeah, definitely check out the article. It's I think it's written by Sam Hines, right? One of the GQ style podcast dudes. Is it G- Sam Hines? Yeah, yeah Samuel Hines. It's called Who Is Zach Beer? I'll link in the show notes for you guys to check out. Really interesting article. Again, for the kids that want to make it in the industry, definitely have a read. Have a read. Have a read. So um, that's an hour of the show in there. I think I'll end it there. Uh, thanks so much for tuning in. As per usual, let me take this off the screen. Where's it going? There we go. Thanks so much for tuning in. Um, it's been a, it's been a, it's been a, it's been a, it's been an adventure, as per usual. Um, if you're listening via podcast app, of course, uh, leave me a five star review, share with your friends. That'd be nice and appreciated. Again, if you want links to the show, definitely click on the description. All the links will be in there. If you're watching via YouTube, definitely smash that like, hit subscribe, leave me a comment, let me know what you think. Uh, follow me on all my socials, be in there as well in the description. And again, I'll see you guys again tomorrow for an episode of the show. But until then, take care, be safe, bye bye.